Hello there. Welcome to our uh, YouTube bar review in taxation. This is our response to attempting to help our bar review candidates from the University of Manila because of the very unstable, very volatile situation arising from COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I will, I will be lecturing on both taxation and mercantile law. And in taxation, I will cover income tax. I will now be covering administrative remedies. Included would be uh, donors and estate taxes, the local tax code, and of course the general principles of taxation, including the constitutional provisions. But this first wave of YouTube uh, uploads will deal with the tax administrative remedies, the battle between the taxpayer and the Bureau of Internal Revenue as the taxpayer files and pays his income tax return. This YouTube upload will cover the fundamental flaw of what happens in a flow chart between the BIR and the taxpayer, including the uh, uh, BIR field examiners, uh, which ends up on the first wave of the conflict where the BIR issues an assessment of deficiency tax and then moves on to the taxpayer submitting his protest by way of either a motion for a reinvestigation or a motion for reconsideration, ultimately ending up with filing an appeal before the Court of Tax Appeals. This is the first uh, YouTube uh, presentation that I'm having on taxation and it will be on tax administrative remedies, the basic component. There will be a second wave where specific uh, issues on the prescription of the tax, the assessment itself, how does, uh, for instance, the comp how, how is the interest and the penalties of 25 and 50% computed. And all these uh, uh, special topics that will not be uh, extensively handled on this first uh, YouTube slide. So let us now proceed. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dean. Jo Santos Balagtas Biskera. I am the incumbent dean, College of Law, University of Manila. I hold the Bachelor of Business Administration, major in accounting, and a certified public accountant, summa cum laude, from the University of the East. I was an ESO scholar and likewise a university scholar when I took up my Master of Business Administration, Magna Cum Laude and Valedictorian at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, the only UE graduate that taught the UP MBA program. I finally achieved my childhood a dream of becoming a lawyer when I went back to UE to finish my Bachelor of Laws cum laude and valedictorian. After graduation with a BBA in accounting and a CPA, I joined the corporate management uh, world starting as a financial analyst in budgets, 
planning and management reporting in a leading petroleum company and ending up at the higher levels of senior management, the last of which was executive vice president, vice president for finance, chief finance officer, uh, corporate treasurer, and controller of leading multinational and local companies to include Fuji Xerox, Motorola Philippines in the electronic semiconductor sector, ESO, which was the first major company I joined as a financial analyst, <clears throat> serving them for five years to end as the most senior accounting supervisor handling cost and inventory accounting when it was already from ESO to Petrol. I was also the director for finance and administration of Smith Klein and French overseas company, a pharmaceutical company now known as Claxo Smith Klein. I was controller of the construction division of Meralco that handled the electromechanical component of the Bataan nuclear power plant, Eco Asia. From ESO, I joined Delgado Brothers Incorporated initially as controller and after one year was promoted as director for management information and financial services of Delgado Brothers Inc., an integrated transport organization. I also work with the with an American company FMC carrying the agricultural chemical Furadan and had wonderful experiences traveling Mindanao and the Visayas catering to the banana and sugar industries. I was controller of a BOI uh, registered pioneer company manufacturing intermodal marine cargo 20-foot containers, Permaline Container Corporation. And while I was uh, busy and fully loaded in the private sector, I also accepted uh, cases as counsel appearing in trial courts and uh, had the opportunity to be nominated twice in 2012 and 2016 as Associate Justice Supreme Court of the Philippines. I am incum an incumbent professorial lecturer in criminal law and mercantile law of the Philippine Judicial Academy, the training arm of the Supreme Court for its judges. I am the incumbent dean, as I was saying, of the uh, College of Law of the University of Manila, its current vice president for legal affairs and member of the board of trustees of the same school. At one time, I was also Vice President for Legal Affairs and Dean of the Colleges of Law at Las Piñas and Binyan of the University of Perpetual Health. I succeeded the illustrious retired Supreme Court uh, Justice Isagani Cruz at University of Perpetual Health in Las Piñas. For 35 uh, years, I was MBA Professor in Financial Management at the De La Salle University. I also had the same stint for 10 years with the University of the Philippines in the Liman and also the University of the East. At one time or another, I was bar reviewer and law professor at the University of the East, the University of Santo Tomas, the De La Salle University in its uh, MBA JD program, the University of Perpetual Health, San Sebastian College, and Far Eastern University. This uh, uploaded YouTube lecture uh, at this point on administrative remedies will cover the letter of authority of the BIR, pre-assessment notice, the assessment itself, the protest of the taxpayer, any possible compromise assessment, 
can appeal to the Court of Tax Appeals. To start the ball rolling, the administrative remedies or the little ping-pong between the taxpayer on one side trying to reduce his tax liability and the BIR trying to squeeze as much taxes as it can is called the administrative remedies pro, uh, exercise and starts when the taxpayer closes his financial books and prepares his audited financial statements. It presupposes that he follows the quarterly submission of his uh, interim uh, tax return and pays the tax thereon. So that when he reaches December 31, he has already covered nine months of, income, of interim income tax returns and have paid the corresponding interim tax. So that by the time he files the uh, uh, prior year income tax return on April 15 of the following year, then he will only be accounting and paying the remainder of uh, October, November, and December operations. And so, he closes his financial books, then prepares his audited financial statements that becomes the basis of his income tax return with the assistance of his external auditors. He submits his income tax return and pays his income tax to the BIR on April 15 of the following year, except for this year when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic disrupted somehow the timetable of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. As the Bureau of Internal Revenue receives the filed income tax return, the BIR now organizes its field audit teams, assigns the teams with letters of authority to specific taxpayers, and these field audit teams now visit and introduce themselves to the taxpayer for tax audit. They provide the taxpayer with the needed schedules on revenues, costs, and expenses, and taxes paid. On the letter of authority, I had a very interesting experience on this matter. After we have filed our April 15 tax return, probably about two months after that, one morning a team of about uh, three examiners from the BIR head office came to, to me to present their letter of authority and introduce themselves with the team that will examine the books. So we had the usual pleasantries and I welcomed them and told them that they should immediately refer any matter to me that would allow them to accelerate their tax audit. And so it was a happy uh, getting to know your thing and they said in about uh, 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 one month's time they'll come back. But they already have a listing of the schedules uh, that they would like us to submit to help them with their tax audit. And then they left. After probably about two or three days, I was again told that a team of BIR examiners are about to see me. And so when I welcomed them, they also presented to me a letter of authority, this time signed by the regional director for the uh, Manila district uh, where we were under. And I examined the uh, letter of authority and I saw nothing wrong with it, but it looks like it is the same letter of authority uh, that was given to me two or three days before, except it was signed by the commissioner and the letterhead was the head office. In all prudence, I tried to softly explain to this new team that an earlier group of their associates came to me to present also a letter of authority. And so I said, I am a little uh, concerned on whom to entertain because I would like to make both of you comfortable with achieving your work objective. And so I said, uh, how do we handle the situation where you have a team from uh, the headquarters group 
from the main office and you are coming from the regional office and it is uh, your regional director who signed the letter of authority but the other letter of authority is signed by the commissioner of internal revenue well it looks like uh, the second group is uh, is aware that these things do happen and so they said uh, uh, they're not surprised that it happens that there are overlaps and they apologize for that but on the side one of them whispered to me and said sir whenever this happens there has to be a way of establishing which team really is authorized and there is only one control point that when a BIR uh, audit team comes to you presenting a letter of authority you will know that they are the authorized uh, examiners if attached to the letter of authority is your original income tax return so I said that do you have it and he showed to me attached to his own copy of the letter of authority the original copy that we filed with the Bureau of Internal Revenue of the internal uh, of the income tax return and I even checked that it was really my original signature so I smiled because it looks like uh, that way of explaining is credible even if they're a little more careful that it may be the uh, uh, top 1000 corporation team in the head office that must be uh, the other team handling our account so I said uh, I am a little uh, confused on this one would you allow me a couple of days to check with our uh, tax uh, consultants uh, SGV uh, and uh, we'll let you know on uh, how we can proceed but be rest assured that we welcome you to be our partners in this audit examination so they left true enough when I consulted our, my uh, tax friends and consultants at SGV they did mention that these things are happening for a lot of uh, reasons that are very interesting but they confirm that the team that has the original copy of the uh, income tax return would be the authorized team so just in case uh, you are confronted with this in the real world or you are asked that question by a naughty examiner in the bar examination you know that that is a trick question that only you listening here and now would probably be able to answer continuing now after the BIR audit team has visited you the BIR team now comes back to you and starts their tax audit examination examining the journals the ledgers and the underlying documents to support the account balances in the income statement and the balance sheet the audit team uh, would also notice some obvious uh, observations and they will tip you off they do not hit you hard on that one they tip you off by issuing uh, periodic pre-assessment notices so that the taxpayer can promptly uh, make an explanation and or uh, gather the documents or, ev or evidences to validate the transactions for tax purposes and so with this the taxpayer is able to provide the documents as evidences of transactions and balances needing clarificatory explanations on book entries ledger balances needing proof missing or overstated revenues costs and expenses after the BIR field audit is finished with all of their needed documentation and their timetable they finalize their audit findings and submits their tax assessment recommendation based on the evidences and field work they conducted this is submitted obviously to their senior officer the uh, regional uh, district uh, 
manager, and then finally elevated to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. And then she delegated that to the regional director. So the commissioner now, or the BIR, issues the tax deficiency assessment based on the field audit findings. So this is, this is the major tool of the BIR to collect taxes. In the recent decisions of the Supreme Court, even tax cases like this required the observation of the constitutional prescription on due process of law. This assessment will contain the itemized uh, findings of the BIR as to the revenues that should have been included but were not included in your, in your income tax return and the expenses that you deducted that the BIR uh, does not allow and therefore disallows them. And so there will be discrepancies in the tax uh, income tax that you paid based on your ITR versus what they estimated based on their own field audit and therefore the assessment. The assessment will not only identify the items that to them are not acceptable, the BIR now is required to present the law that essentially is their basis for such disallowances or impositions of additional taxes. The uh, taxpayer obviously receives the assessment to determine whether that tax assessment is beyond the three-year period of prescription. Take note that the taxpayer should immediately check whether the assessment is being uh, submitted to him within three years from the time of the filing of the ITIR. Otherwise, if the tax assessment is served beyond the three-year period, then the taxpayer has won his first round because any assessment beyond three years from the date IT, the ITR was filed is already part of the prescriptive period and the tax liability has prescribed. And therefore, the taxpayer can now move to protest the issuance of the assessment on the basis of prescription. Now, but if in the examination of the taxpayer, the assessment was issued within three years, then he goes now into the second defensive motion that he can take against it pay, having to pay additional taxes. And this is to check whether the assessment is correct or wrong. So the taxpayer now scrutinizes the items that were disallowed in terms of deductions or the, inclu the inclusion of revenues that he did not include to determine whether or not the BIR assessment is wrong as to the legal precepts, insufficient documentation as evidences, and computations. There is the assessment. There is the taxpayer reviewing whether or not the assessment is wrong. Unfortunately, he finds that it is not wrong, meaning it is a correct assessment, and it is probably better for him to pay the tax deficiency assessment. Who knows, the assessment could have even been higher had the BIR found more time to identify the disallowances. So some taxpayers would immediately pay, more so when the uh, tax deficiency is tolerable. But assuming for the sake of the exercise that the taxpayer did not agree with the assessment, he now has the opportunity to file a protest. And that protest against the assessment has to be filed within 30 days from the time he received the assessment where he had Differences with the BIR on legal precepts, insufficient documents as evidences, and computations. The protest can either be in, 
in the form of a motion for reconsideration or a motion for investigation, either which should reach the BIR 30 days from the date the assessment was filed, was received by the taxpayer. Since the taxpayer has a protest, the taxpayer files a motion for reinvestigation when he raises questions of facts in the assessment. It is possible that the BIR did not uh, receive any documents as evidences to uh, support the stand of the taxpayer. And when the taxpayer for any reason finds these necessary documents, then the appropriate protest would be a motion for investigation so that he can now submit those documents for the BAR to uh, reassess again his their position with the documentation as evidences. But assuming it is not the uh, it is not the uh, question of fact that comes up, it is now a question of law. So that the taxpayer now will file a protest by way of a motion for reconsideration because they differ in the way to interpret the law. The motion for reconsideration becomes the uh, protest and is submitted to the BIR 30 days from the receipt of the assessment. The taxpayer is also allowed another 60 days to present his supporting documents in order to strengthen his protest. And the pro obviously the supporting documents would complement and strengthen the motion for investigation on, a, on questions of facts and the motion for reconsideration when it is a question of law. Now the BIR is holding on to the motion for reconsideration or motion for investigation. The BIR now is faced with the question of whether or not to issue a decision. And the BIR decides to issue a decision by reviewing all the contents of their assessment and perhaps uh, agreeing with the taxpayer to set aside some of their uh, initial observation, but would hold on to certain items that they think the uh, taxpayer cannot uh, ob uh, overturn. And so what happens is when the BIR therefore removes some of the disallowances, then the assessment can be lowered. And so there can be a compromise assessment, a level much lower than the original assessment. And this compromise assessment is now given to the taxpayer who will examine the final disposition of that assessment. And if he agrees, he now pays the reduced deficiency tax. On the other hand, if the taxpayer finds that he cannot agree even with the reduced deficiency tax, the taxpayer files now an appeal with the Court of Tax Appeals within 30 days from the BIR compromise assessment. So, the, the uh, appeal to the Court of Tax Appeals must reach the CTA 30 days from the time the BIR finalizes its final compromise assessment. However, the BIR need not reach this point. The BIR has the option not to pay attention to the protest. And so the BIR can decide to issue, not to issue any decision on the protest and allows 180 days to uh, lapse after the taxpayer's protest has been submitted to the BIR. So the taxpayer waits for the decision to be issued by the BIR within 180 days. But when the taxpayer finally realizes no decision is forthcoming 
when the uh, when the waiting period reaches 180 days, he can already presume that the BIR denied the protest. At this point, therefore, if if the taxpayer feels that he does not agree with the final assessment of the BIR, then he now proceeds to make his appeal to the Court of Appeals on the premise that his protest has been denied by the BIR. And that particular appeal has to reach the Court of Tax Appeals 30 days from the 180 days that the BIR did not act on the particular protest. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our uh, simplified way of uh, presenting the administrative remedies.